And our discussion will be moderated by Howard Jacob of the Hudson Alpha Institute with discussants Les B. Seeker from NHGRI and Ned Kalange from the Colorado Trust. Colorado Trust. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the speakers. I thought that was very informative and should, I think, engender some good conversation. We'll start off with Les and then Ned. <clears throat> Great, the thank you. Too. We're not. <laughs> I have notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> oh, great. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I had a couple thoughts based on the presentations. I was uh, really intrigued, um, Jonathan, by that uh, model you brought up, uh, the, the Freibeck Thornburg model. And I thought you didn't go quite where I was thinking on this, which I think is um, another thing to think about, which is you talked about that, uh, the delta really of the clinical utility. And what's interesting to think about is that in fact, opportunistic screening or population screening for disorders through genomic testing will actually yield the largest delta. Because if that's not why the test was ordered and that's not what the clinician is even thinking about when they ordered the testing, the change in how you think about the patient is going to be the largest. Because the converse of that is what you did mention, which is the confirmatory genetic test, where really you're changing nothing. And if you meet the criteria for CF, two delta 508 alleles doesn't do very much for you. So it's interesting to think about that, you know, where we may have our biggest impact on clinical care is taking a patient for whom nobody is currently suspecting that disorder and completely changing our thinking about that patient. So uh, that has, uh, I think, a number of implications. Um, the other one is in thinking about evidence, and that came up in all three talks of uh, generating evidence, and of course, everyone agrees with that. I think we have to also keep in mind what should be the comparator, and I often talk about um, what is called the nirvana fallacy, which is comparing some real thing to an abstract ideal of what that thing should or could be. And we often do that in genomics and say, gosh, the penetrance of that variant isn't 100%, or gosh, we don't know everything about the clinical utility of finding that variant in a patient. When in fact, in current practice, we are currently using many tests to evaluate the same patients for the same indication that have clearly terrible uh, utility and very little evidence. And so uh, an example of that is imaging for intellectual disability or autism. That is done all the time. And as far as I'm aware, it is routinely reimbursed by third-party payers. And you could probably generate some numbers pretty quickly to say that genome or exome sequencing may cost five to seven times what a cranial MRI costs. Mark, what? the same, but then you look at our yield is probably 10 times higher, right, of what we find, 30. Okay, there you go. Uh, Mark has done the numbers. And so that should be our comparator. And then we say to our, our colleagues and to the payers, we think you should move imaging off the initial evaluation of this patient and substitute it with this other test because your value proposition is much higher. That's the right kind of comparison to make, not all this whining about it doesn't meet some abstract ideal of what a perfect test should be. And the third one relates to both uh, uh, Julie's and uh, Jonathan's uh, talks about what kind of an evidence base we need. And one of the things that wasn't mentioned, which I struggle with a lot, is now, not all of what we're talking about here is exome and genome scale sequencing, but I think that is an important consideration. And one of the challenges is, is that test, if you can think of it as a test, I'm not sure it is, will be um, economically justifiable, I think, in the end, for relatively few single indications. It's pretty expensive and maybe for undifferentiated intellectual disability or autism might be one of them, but not a lot of others. When you just think about it as a test to answer an indication, what it actually is is a resource that will be amortized 
across many downstream uses over a long period of time. And um, uh, Julie's comments about we need to do more studies across networks, thinking about how to design studies that can begin to get a handle on that long-term utility of this as a healthcare resource is an even bigger challenge. I think we'll, we'll need to figure out how to do it, and we don't have to wait until that's done to use the test, but I think that's one of our uh, utility uh, evidence challenges that we face. Thanks, Les. Ned? Thanks, Les. <clears throat> First of all, I, I really want to agree with Julie. I, I, I mean, I just, and, and Jonathan and Roger, because they actually said everything that you should say. So I'm going to try to just make a few other points. First of all, I want to recognize that when I started in, I'm not a geneticist, and I always start with that. I just, I'm an evidence person. And when I started in genetics, it was all association. And someone said, association isn't enough. So then we move to actionability. And what you're hearing today is actionability isn't enough. That what payers, if I think about sustainability of implementation, you only have two problems, right? The payers and the doctors, just two problems. So I'm going to take them separately. And the payers say, you need to change an important health outcome. So you've heard that. So perfect. And just kind of keep that in mind, important health outcome. I love reading about Ignite in preparation because you're doing what we need to have done. You're generating new, important clinical information. So the uh, clopidogrel example was fascinating to me because I saw the survival curve separate and it made me happy until I read that, well, we're just not using that drug anymore because we have alternatives. So uh, ho hopefully there'll be some economic pressure to say we still should test and use it because it's better in some situations. Um, I think the other thing to point out is, <clears throat> and you're talking about Delta, it's not just benefit, it's the marginal benefit. So how much effort are we going to put in for marginal benefit? So I know uh, Dr. Borwinkle works on genetic testing in the cardiac space to make, to be better than Framingham. And the problem is Framingham's not bad. And so that marginal benefit needs to really say, I'm going to treat people that I wouldn't have treated otherwise and have important health outcomes, and I'm going to not treat people that I otherwise would have treated and therefore save money and not have adverse outcomes. So thinking about the size of the marginal benefit is important. Don't, that, that phrase, medical necessity, you should go to sleep with, right? I mean, I, I don't actually know what it means. Um, but it, it's the way decisions are made. And so thinking about the inputs to medical necessity, um, I would think, have you think about it another way. What would happen today to the health of the people of the United States if genetics went away? If we just said, Terry, all this investment, whole institute, <laughs> criticism in JAMA, right? <laughs> we were wrong, let's just not do it. What would be the impact to the overall health of the population. And I think you want to think about that in terms of medical necessity, that if we don't do it, then people are not going to be as well or live as long. Um, less than 1% of publications are T2. Ugh. So maybe this is just the natural lifespan of a new science, but you got to change that because if we aren't getting to the place where T2 is driving the bus, right, we're never going to get this implemented. Um, I never, I, I didn't hear other things like, uh, Jonathan came very close, but, uh, you know, I'm a preventionist, and for years we had this thing called the wilson Jung criteria for screening for disease. And the last element of their criteria is it should compete favorably with other uh, needs for the same resources. <clears throat> so you should think about if we weren't spending money on genomics, where could we spend it? And I got to tell you, there's a lot of areas for benefit. I think I said this at a NCI meeting that if we could just increase the number of people we screen for hypertension and hyperlipidemia from the current incredibly low levels, incredibly low levels, this is stuff we know works. We'd save thousands, tens of thousands of lives in every state. 
And to me, that's an opportunity cost. That's saying, should we focus on genomics? Should we focus on other things that we know work? That's kind of the Wilson-Jung issue. Um, please don't forget about harms. We had very little discussion from anyone on evidence of harms. So we always think, we're like all clinicians, we think about new interventions in terms of benefit. And we never think about the potential downside. We had a little bit of that in talking about diversity, but I'd ask you to, to remember no medical intervention is without the chance of doing harm. And then finally on the payer side, the David Eddy phrase of evidence-based medicine, remember he says, when there's insufficient evidence, be conservative, but if there's harms or costs, don't do it. Now, not everyone agrees with that rule, but I think that the payers, thinking about medical necessity, kind of adhere to that. If I could turn quickly to the doctors and then I'll stop. They are not thinking about the initials APOL1 or CYP2C19. They are thinking about MACRA, MIPS. If you don't know what those mean, that's what's driving primary care batty. They aren't thinking about genomic medicine, they're thinking about the new way that they're gonna be reimbursed for services and those are MACRA and MIPS, and the MDP, the medical uh, diagnostic, no, it's not diagnostic, it's the data set that they're going to be looked at for their quality. And I just looked through it in preparation for this meeting, and it only talks about genetis, genetics in terms of medical geneticists. So you're, you're not on the radar screen for CMS from a quality standpoint, and these, these acronyms, these payment reform systems, it, it, they're keeping genomics off the radar screen. So they're looking for survival. I'd ask you to think about talking to clinicians with the probability that implementing genetic medicine will help any of their patients. I know that sounds crazy, but if you think about mammography, mammography will save seven lives out of a thousand women screened for their lives between 30 and 74. That means most primary clinicians will never have a patient whose life they save with mammography unless it's an all-woman population. Now we do mammography and we all do it and we do it based on more of a population approach advocacy and the way that our society looks at breast cancer. I think if you want to convince clinicians to do something new Tell them it's going to help them patient and help them understand it. Uh, I was talking to pediatricians recently saying, we'd like you to screen for mental health problems in children. And pediatricians are my favorite clinicians because, sorry, no one take offense, but the sense of patient advocacy is just woven into their souls. And what they told me was, oh my God, don't add something else. I can't do anything else. I had one of my residents when I was in family medicine faculty saying, Ned, I loved you talking about all this prevention stuff, behavior change, people should stop smoking, and I gotta tell you, I just don't do it in practice because I don't get paid for it. Um, and <laughs> so if I wanna put a positive spin on that, <laughs> the clinician is seeing an opportunity cost. He can spend his time more useful doing something else with the patient and get paid for it. My last thing is really heresy. So Kaiser put together a DVT Lovenox program. So I was sitting in the clinic. I had a patient come in with a hot leg. I said, I think this person has a DVT. I sent them up to the radiology suite. They did a study. And next thing I know, the clinical pharmacist is saying, Ned, your patient has a DVT. We're going to start them on Lovenox. We'll follow all of their numbers. We're going to switch them over to warfarin. It'll be great. And I didn't have to do anything except smile. R remember, when I was an intern, I would spend nights, right? You all did, chasing PTTs, right? So this was a godsend. What am I trying to get to? When I was designing prevention programs for Kaiser Permanente, I came to the conclusion I could be most successful if I just designed the doctors out. The system will work best 
if you don't add something for me to do. So all the great clinical informatics, if there's a way to have a nurse or a pharmacist do it, it's gonna be way easier to get implemented in clinical practice if you don't rely on me to change my behavior. So I think I tried to add some new things to what you guys said, and then I gotta tell you, you nailed it when, when you're in your presentations. I'll give the uh, speakers a chance to comment first, and then we'll open it to the panel, so. I mean, to the rest of the floor. So, so, I, so I, I have a few comments. First of all, uh, to Dr. Biesiger, I, I, I kind of, I don't actually agree with the statement that it's not going to be cost effective to do, for example, exome sequencing. I, I, the, to do exome sequencing for a specific clinical indication, <coughs> I, which is, I think you said you didn't think it would ever be cost effective. I, did, I said I didn't think it would be cost effective. Right, for very individual many individual indications. indications. And I, I guess I would, I would take issue with that because I believe that the costs of doing it are dropping so substantially that in, in my view, um, it, it will be cost effective. I, 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 think, I, think, I think some of this, some of this discussion has, has not sufficiently broken down context as well in terms of what the, what the value of the testing is uh, uh, what, what the evidence needs to be for it based upon uh, that, that particular context. Um, for example, uh, testing, testing a, a person, for example, with developmental delay, a child, to find the answer to that question is, will a, abrupt a life, years, years of investigation that will be extremely expensive, it will, it will, uh, it will give satisfaction to to, to, uh, to patients. And I think for, in those, in, for example, in the inherited disease context, I do believe that finding the answer, you know, as, a, as any geneticist will argue, is, is a utility. Um, you, you know, whether or not to give a drug based upon the test, that's going to require a higher level of evidence. And, and again, then that's going to depend on the particular context in which the drug is given and the particular setting. Whether you're going to screen something, that is a very different issue, whether you're going to screen healthy people. And I, so, so, we, so screening a healthy person is, is a completely diametrically opposed. It, it, it's at the other end of the spectrum of, for example, what I was talking about with a, basically a patient who's looking at death. And, and, I think, and I think the decision-making process needs to take those elements, um, elements in, into context. And I think the value has to be assessed in, the, in, in that way. And, and I think the, 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 the evidence and th that's required needs to be placed within that framework and within that context. If you're preaching, I'm the choir. <laughs> I, I don't get accused of being uh, under exuberant about genomics very often, but you did it. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, um, no, I was actually thinking, you know, my, denom my denominator there, I completely agree with everything you said. And I'll just uh, explain my comment. My denominator was more based on, if you think about all of the clinical encounters where a clinician then orders a test, if that's your denominator, I don't think exome or genome is a very big numerator for that denominator. But I completely agree with everything you said, and I think there will be plenty of indications. It's just not a lot of them, but what I'm excited about is the fact that once that data set is acquired, and I was very excited about uh, Josh's concept of having yet, um, what was the word you used, Josh? Escrow. The escrow, that's, we will then go back in and dip out of that over and over and over again. And every time you do that, the effective cost of that exome or genome is falling. So that's great, I agree. So I, I just, um, so, so thanks, Ned, because um, I, I think your comments were fantastic. I'll just clarify on the clopidogrel. Um, so I think, and, and Josh didn't show these data, but I think they do have data on clopidogrel use. I believe it represents still um, the majority of antiplatelet therapy. Um, but the other important thing, and, and we didn't really address this, is that the cost um, for a month of clopidogrel is about $4. The cost of the other two drugs is about 200 per month. Um, and even with most prescription benefits, the pays in many are $50 to $70 a month. So, so there are huge barriers to access. And, and we think even if you want to start with the alternative, having the genotype, and then you know if you switch after the first month, which is the high-risk period, to clopidogrel, 
that's still probably a bad idea if they carry a loss of function. Um, but, I, and I also want to comment, so a lot of the success in our program um, at UF is because we indeed had clinical pharmacists sort of driving that, um, facilitating that drug switch. Um, we've, we've just implemented in another hospital, and the other way we've gotten around it, because we found that um, doing anything that impacted workflow for the physician is almost a non-starter, and so the other way we are doing it in, in this new hospital setting is you in, using the Spartan genotyping system, where basically they have it in the cath lab, and it sort of doesn't change anything about their workflow. They make the drug decision. But I, I think you're exactly right, and we've, we've actually experienced that in our implementation. One of our biggest barriers to implementing um, was, you know, when we, especially with an interventional cardiologist, we talked about impacting the workflow. It, it, it was a short conversation. Okay, I'll, I think we'll, yeah, okay, I'll Jonathan, one, go ahead. one very brief comment. I want to get to the audience. I mean, one, one thing that none of us mentioned that came up a little bit earlier was education. And I think sustainability is about, you know, bringing in the new crop of physicians and other medical specialties to be able to rapidly adopt things as they prove useful. And so that might be another consideration um, as far as the sustainability piece. Okay, we'll open it up. Mark, you had a... Yeah, um, two quick comments, uh, but before that, I want to solve Ned's problem about what the definition of medical necessity is. As a former medical director, I came up with one. It actually dates to Lewis Carroll through Humpty Dumpty. Medical necessity means precisely what I say it means, neither more nor less. So that is the <laughs> definitive definition of medical necessity. Uh, my two comments, one was related to uh, Roger's um, discussion of the rare variants. And I think we have a sustainable model. Now, whether we could replicate that model, I don't know. But I would argue that the children's oncology group has taken the, the approach from decades ago where they said all of these pediatric tumors are rare. The only way we're going to learn anything is by aggregating data, treating kids on protocols. And that protocolized care is something that is paid for by third-party payers. All the data is aggregated. About 85% of the kids in this country are treated on a COG protocol. Um, if we could somehow replicate that type of um, uh, group in the uh, somatic uh, variants, I think you could actually have a sustainable model. Now, whether that's possible, I think, is a completely different question. The second um, thing relates to what Julie had said about reimagining Ignite as another network like some of the other NHGRI networks. And I would argue against that because I, the thing I see as valuable to Ignite is that um, you had the opportunity um, to let different groups sort of innovate in the space. And what I would argue is what you might want to look at is uh, even going further down that road, which is to try and create a system of innovation where you could identify groups that could go in and either fail quickly or um, find success quickly that could then be moved out into a network type of a model, much as you did with the clopidogrel. Now, again, that is a completely different type of infrastructure um, uh, to think about, but what we don't have is really any space where you can kind of innovate quickly, find out what works, what doesn't work, and then move the successful things forward while moving away from the things. We just say everything's got to be four years or five years or three years, and so you spend four years on something that's not going to work. Other questions or comments? Jeff. I just um, wanted to put a finer point on something that somebody said. I'm not, I can't remember who it was, but as we think about the paradigm of generating evidence, which I fully embrace, we should also be able to articulate what waste are we actually taking out of the system? Can we actually talk about not just adding another um, technology or test to an already overburdened system. I think the health the, the healthcare systems and the payers will actually look for the uh, exchange of those for something that, that is not going to be effective. So can we define the goals of the future of Ignite perhaps in some of those contexts? I would I would think that would be very positive to do. Lon? So I'm in this mode of um, thinking about Ignite too as a council member here and uh, uh, I thought I hit it. I'm just not speaking into it. Sorry. I'm in the mode of thinking next steps uh, on this, and it's quite, it's a, it's, the button's on with the little guy that's sneezing. Speak to it. My, my light's on here. It's on down here. It's not. 
It's shorting. It's shorting. I've clearly spoken too much today, so I apologize. It, it's okay. Uh, no, it's a quick question for, for um, Julie, actually, on this. So, uh, and I'm, you gave us a hint on the Clopidogrel larger study by saying most, much of the data is from Vanderbilt and it's in the packet, so I'm looking at it. My question is one of, um, you made a strong case for, for need for further evidence. There was evidence there at 400. There's evidence there at 4,000 that looks largely the same. So is, is there a lot different other than a few zeros in front of the p-value, and how many times do we need to overpower things in order to exemplify that, that significance level scales with sample size? Well, I, I can answer that. She said it in one, right, one word. She says not a randomized controlled trial. So, of course, when you showed the first survival curve, and I knew it wasn't randomized, I said, was well, there something different about the patients that they didn't follow the recommendation? And that's why 400 isn't enough. So I think that you could imagine a different population. You could imagine some inherent biases in the clinicians. And it's hard to imagine that in two settings. Um, uh, the, so the directness of the evidence, you know, we talk about direct evidence in, in terms of benefit. The directness is somewhat influenced by numbers. So if I said, well, I think, uh, Cervical cancer screening prevents deaths from cervical cancer. And I can show these nine women that I, you know, or 400 women. That's, that's not a randomized control, it's not direct evidence. When a country like Denmark starts screening and the death rate from cervical cancer goes to zero, that's compelling. So it's a number and a directness and a worry about bias when you don't have that RCT out in front of it. I, I don't know if 4,000 is necessary. But I would, I would be, I was already thinking about problems with the study until, until the end got big. In two, in no, more it's, it's, great, it's a great response because that's an important distinction that, that the, the larger sample is giving you greater confidence. It's not just a p-value that's making a wow factor here. Th th those aren't the same. Well, and I, and I really do think it's, it's two things. It's because we could have had 4,000 at UF and it would be a different level of evidence. So it's that we have, you know, or 4,500 patients across nine health settings um, and, and that, that the completeness of that, including the sample size, um, I think sort of tells a story that no matter what the sample size is in a single center, I think you, you wouldn't get over the, the questions that people would have about a single center data. Bob? I was going to uh, bring up a completely different subject that we haven't talked about yet today, which is um, what do you think the impact is going to be of things like the five state lawsuits against the maker of brand name Clopidogrel? Uh, and whether that kind of um, trial, as opposed to a randomized controlled trial, is going to start having an impact on people's need to actually utilize genomic information in their clinical practice. I should mention that I'm thinking back decades ago when some of the original prenatal um, Down syndrome screening uh, was driven by an unfortunate lawsuit. Yeah, as, a, so, as, a, as opposed to our, our highest level of um, medical evidence gathering. Yeah, so, um, so, so, and I don't know what the five states are, but I think the first state was Hawaii, which has high Asian ancestry and Asians about seven, 60 to 70 percent carry a loss of function allele. Um, and their argument is that the drug maker knew that these people had reduced benefit and um, they still marketed in that population. I mean, I think in the pharmacogenetic space, that has sort of been this argument, you know, maybe lawsuits will drive some of these. I think we haven't seen that. TPMT, which has been used um, clinically to drive um, thiopurine therapy for a long time, I don't, I don't think really have seen that. So, so I think, you know, as a, as a uh, genomic medicine researcher, community, if we want to count on lawsuits to, to drive things forward, you know, we may be here in 30 years not making any progress. So, I mean, I think it's possible, um, but it, we, we really, we, I don't know that we've seen much of it. Um, that, that doesn't mean we won't see it moving forward. Any other questions or comments? Can I, can I just no. make a comment from up here? So, um, I just couldn't let it go past that that um, diversity and inclusion and health equity is such a big part of this project. I want to thank and recognize NH, uh, in, in, NHRI, NHRG, 
<laughs> see, see, that's the problem, Terry. You guys created an acronym that's different from all the other institutes. The genome <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just for me. Uh, that's remarkable. I wish we did it in all medicine. I think the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force often got criticized for saying, well, the prevalence is higher in different uh, races or ethnicities, and so why didn't you comment on that? And it's because the studies didn't include sufficient numbers to make any any uh, uh, specific recommendations. And so by starting out that way and being a leader for the rest of the institutes, which I honestly think you are, that's really great. And for those of you who don't have the internet, MACRA is the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. MIPS is Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. Should scare you if you're a primary care clinician. And the NDP is a Quality Measurement Development Plan, which then generates the PQRS, the Physician Quality Reporting System. And these are the things that scare family docs, general internal medicines, and pediatricians because their livelihoods depend on them. Well, I would like to thank the... I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize because we're running out of time. So I'd like to thank the panel, and I'm going to summarize uh, what I heard. Uh, we have some notes, and we're going to uh, put this back up on the on the table uh, at the end of the meeting. So first of all, in order to get the uh, the major issues around utility and ev evidence base, if we're going to have sustainability, we're going to have to convince payers uh, that this is an important endpoint. So I'd like to make sure that in this session, although it's separated, that I think we need to in the next round have the payers to the table at the same time. I think the, the need to have larger numbers is very important. Um, but I think, as Julie pointed out, it probably comes down to the different clinical sites also being involved, more clinical sites. And I think there's also an opportunity around the different clinical sites is having a different payer mix. And that different payer mix, I think it goes back to that first principle of we got to get the payers involved. So you have different payer mixes, you have different economic models around your fee for service, as well as around your accountable care side uh, in managed care. So those pieces I think should probably also be looked at. I think a very interesting point that was made is that, and Jeff brought this up, and I was also going to emphasize this, if you can actually start with the principle of some, in some of your tests for your renewal that, for example, children with disabilities getting screened with an MRI, which is cost per cost about the same, and you could actually go in and show that, you actually have a targeted strategy of replacing one set of costs with another. I think that could be incredibly creative uh, as you go forward uh, for your renewal. To that point, there's that balance that Mark came up with, which is we want to be able to fail early, fail quick. So if you could have some of those that you could target, but then also have the ability of the network to expand relatively quickly, I think that's incredibly important because that is going to be the name of the game, I believe, is having the payers involved, having the numbers, and having the way to show that you can change medical costs. I think that's really an important opportunity. The other part that uh, is... Um, Important is that there's not going to be any single test comparator. I think Les's point, if I understood correctly, is that if you look at the fact that we are going to make a diagnosis today about 30% of the time, we could argue that, well, we're going to fail 70% of the time. I think the point, if I understood, was that the value proposition is not the failure at that individual test, but the value proposition comes in later. Again, that's been a discussion point through the day, which is how do we capture that inside the EHRs and other strategies for managing this. We still have the problems around medical necessity, um, even with Mark's clear definition. Uh, we still have that challenge. And I do also agree with uh, the T2 studies being less than 1%. Um, we can all stand up and argue all that we want, but that T2 studies are really critically important as we go down the road and get physician buying around that. The payment reform, I think it fits back into that other line. Are there ways to do like what we were talking about with the MRI? Um, could we look at some of those payer mixes and come up with strategies that would enforce that, that would now help that tool become more sustainable uh, with those physicians. And I don't know enough about the acronyms, but I'm going to look uh, to see whether or not any of those pieces have a value proposition around that. Otherwise, it won't get on the horizon uh, for, for reimbursement and payment. 
Um, I think uh, the other issue is that education uh, is also a critical point. And then I'm going to finish by saying, as Mark's point, you know, uh, the Children's Oncology Group has really shown that these types of strategies can be really important. Now, is that a unique subset? I think we don't know enough around that. I'm going to say it certainly isn't unique by itself. But I think that model and looking at that as a positive reinforcement is the way to go. So with that, we'll, con we'll conclude and move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have the Economic Considerations Panel. We'll have State of the Science Gaps by Bob Nussbaum and Mark Williams.